The woke church is a counterfeit. It has great influence, but no power. It attracts crowds of spectators, but produces no followers of Jesus. It puts on a great performance, but everyone goes home to life as usual. But what if the woke church woke up? That's exactly what's going to happen. And the revival that breaks out, well, it's gonna be unlike anything that's ever been seen. The woke ideology is nothing more than empty human thinking. Get ready because this is Jesus Ain't Woke. How many of you guys are excited to be a part of the end time revival? Isn't it a blessing that God chose to put us at this place in time? Some people look at it like a curse, but I'm like, man, how cool it is to be alive right now. Amen. Well, y'all, welcome to No Limits Church. Today, we're continuing our series called Jesus Ain't Woke. But before we get into that, I want you to just turn to somebody next to you and say, you made a good choice being here today. And if you're joining us online, I want to say hey to you too. Thanks for being with us. It's great to hear the word of God over the internet. But if you ever have the chance to be with us here in person, come on and join us. We'd love to have you. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Cade, and I'm the lead pastor here alongside my wife, Beth. And at No Limits, we're here to help you know God, find freedom, and discover purpose. And in this series, my goal is to help you know God by exposing fake Christianity. Like I've told you, this misled group of people, they call themselves woke because they've discovered that the ancient scriptures are out of touch with modern Christianity. Yet, can you even call it Christianity if the Bible isn't the ultimate guidebook? The reality is you're only a Christian if you believe in and follow Jesus Christ. And the Bible refers to Jesus as the word of God. So when it comes down to it, you really can't follow yourself, call yourself a follower of Jesus if you're not following the Bible, right? Following Jesus, following the Bible is kind of synonymous. Well, Christianity, it's not Christianity at all. It's just a fake version of Christianity that either denies or misuses the word of God in favor of making sure nobody gets their feelings hurt. Because we're all about feelings these days. I'll give them this, though. They're clever. They say a lot of things that sound really good. You're like, oh, that sounds good. Seems right, but some doesn't check out with this, right? It's because almost all of the things that are woke lead to destruction, but not on my watch, because I'm going to keep exposing wokeness for the evil that it is. And the reason I want to do that is because I don't want people to go to hell. I don't. I'm here to help you follow Jesus so that we can all go to heaven together and bring a lot of people with us. Who wants to bring some people with you to heaven? Be a party, right? Awesome. Well, this message is my God-given assignment in this season. Jesus ain't woke, and I'll do whatever it takes to get the message out to everybody who needs it. I'll even go on a photo shoot and dress up like Jesus to get some Instagram photos. Thank you, Sam, for helping me with that. I was hoping that'd give you all a good laugh. Coming soon on Instagram. So in the first week of this series, I explained how Satan is after our kids. We were made in God's image. Satan hates God, so he hates us. Yet God gave us this amazing ability to multiply, right? Speaking of, I would like to let you all know that all this talk about multiplication has produced some fruit here at church. Beth and I are expecting our fifth child. Go ahead and wave your hand, Beth, for people that don't know where you're at. This will be five kids in six years. <laughs> so, uh, baby is due in April, for those of you who want to know. I know everybody wants these. The women want the details, right? That's the only detail I have for you. If you want more details, go talk to Beth. She'll give those to you. So here we are. We keep filling the earth with more and more humans, and Satan's doing whatever he can to stop the multiplication. And he has lots of strategies for this, just none of them are working in the young house. But you still need to know about them. Here's one. Create a culture where kids are a nuisance, so people don't want to have kids, and they push aside the ones that they do have. It's kind of where we're living, right? Satan also works to make society numb to killing babies through abortion. He takes it a step further by normalizing food and drugs that ruin the reproductive system. Oh, and the one he's most proud of, right? It's even called the pride movement. Satan's a pro at promoting homosexuality, so reproduction is impossible. I think that's his favorite. I hope you're able to see what's going on. Almost all the challenges that we're up against right now lead to one thing. 
the destruction of children. It's crazy. I mean, this past Friday, all but one House Democrat voted in favor of any kind of abortion at any time for any reason. All but one House Democrat. So killing babies is a top priority for Miss Pelosi and her posse, right? It's, it's really sad. It's <laughs> and when you tolerate abortion instead of standing against it, you're advancing Satan's agenda. When you advocate for the LGBTQ plus movement, you're advancing Satan's agenda. The church has been quiet on these issues for a long time, but it's time. It's time to issue a counterattack on evil. Satan's working hard to destroy people with normalized sins, so we as the body of Christ are supposed to work hard to expose the dangers of sin so people are drawn to Jesus Christ and receive their salvation. Amen? Amen. Salvation and freedom, and that's what we talked about last week. Jesus didn't just give you forgiveness of sin. He gave you freedom from sin. He came to take your sin away. Man, that's good. Yet there's people who call themselves Christians everywhere who choose to live a life of sin. They think they can just keep on sinning and say that they belong to God. But take a look at this scripture. I'll let John tell this to you guys. But when when people keep on sinning, it shows they belong to the devil who's been sinning since the beginning. I mean, the church has done a good job ignoring this truth right here so it doesn't get in the way of putting butts in the seats. On Sunday morning, but the truth is, it's necess- this is truth is necessary for people to receive true salvation. If no one tells you that Jesus came to take away your sin, you'll believe that all you have to do is say a little prayer, and that's it. You're saved. We might as well just slap Jesus in the face if we're going to reduce salvation down to this little prayer that we say at church, and then nothing changes. When you truly receive salvation by believing in Jesus Christ, the power of God changes your life immediately you're forgiven of everything you've done wrong. And not only that, but Jesus reaches into your life and he takes the sin out of your life. You don't even like it anymore. You don't even want it anymore. It's like he's made you a new person. And he has. I think there's a scripture for that, right? It's not that you'll never sin again, right? We can all attest to that in this room. But you no longer keep on sinning. Keep on. Instead, you live a life of repentance, right? When sin is revealed, you, you turn the other way. You're like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to do with that. Because when you believe in Jesus, you follow Jesus. And he leads you down this glorious path of complete freedom from sin. That's the path he's leading you down. Are you all getting this? Are you all getting it? You got to understand that the church cannot tolerate sin. We can't tolerate it. If we do, the power of God cannot be made manifest in our services. And without the power of God, what do we have? What do we have? You know, a comfortable woke church might draw a large crowd, but without the power of God, it's really worthless what's going on. We can't lead people to salvation without the power of God present. We can't heal people without the power of God present. We can't operate in spiritual gifts without the power of God present. So for the sake of everyone out there who's headed to hell because they have yet to receive salvation, stop tolerating sin in your life. It's your enemy. Get it out. Get rid of it. Be done with it. Let Jesus take away your sin so you can operate in the power of God. That's the motivation. Let me show it to you in scripture. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter's talking to the church and he's reminding them of how wonderful it is that they're born again. Anybody think it's wonderful to be born again? And then he reminded them how they received their salvation. I want you to take a look at what he said. He said, this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These people received salvation only because somebody told them the good news in the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, we've been taught that all you have to do to lead somebody to salvation is tell them about Jesus. But you have to do more than just tell them. You have to show up with the power of God and tell them. So how do we walk in this power? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. What's a prerequisite to being filled with the Holy Spirit? Anybody remember? Obedience to God. And here's how Jesus explains that. In John 14, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. And here's what will happen. I'll pray the Father. He'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit. If you want the power of God to manifest in your life, just like it did through Jesus, obedience to God is required. Anybody like a good old requirement? (laughs) 
You see, when we choose to tolerate sin in the name of love, we dismiss the power of God. And a lot of churches do that. They just dismiss the power of God because the power of God cannot exist alongside disobedience. But you will always struggle with obedience if it comes from the wrong place. We've talked about it. I'm going to remind you. By default, obedience is a performance. We perform for God by doing our best to live like he wants us to. We think God's impressed when we get it right. We think he yells at us when we get it wrong. But God doesn't want us to perform. He doesn't want us to perform. You've probably already figured this out, but we're not capable of a flawless performance. Anybody? I mean, the worship team might be able to pull that up. (laughs) No, you're not going to claim that. But we just keep messing it up. But the good news is there is another way to obedience. Obedience Obedience to God comes one of two ways. Either we're performing or it's an overflow of knowing who we are in Christ. Obedience comes easy when we know who we are to God. It just, it just comes easy. And the only way to know who we are to God is to know his word, right? Look at this. Romans 5, 17. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. Everybody say, thanks, Adam. Thanks. All right. <laughs> but even greater is God's wonderful, wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. This is who you are to God. You are triumphant over sin. Somebody say that. I am triumphant over sin. When you come face to face with sin, you win every time. But the only reason you're able to do this is because you've received God's gift of righteousness. Righteousness is a gift. You receive it, and then you walk in it. You receive it, and then you walk in it. Let me put it to you this way. In Romans 6, 11, consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Once again, this is your true identity in Christ. You are dead to sin and alive to God. That's who you are. Notice it doesn't say that the power of sin is dead. No, sin is still very much here, all around us. But that's okay, because you are dead to sin. Y'all get this, just like COVID-19 is not interested in a dead person, right? Sin is not interested in a dead person. And you are dead to sin. Sin's not interested in you anymore. That's awesome. So how do we walk in this? Well, Romans 8, 13, through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature. How do we walk free from sin? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is so good. So good. Let's tie it all together. Obedience comes easy when I know who I am to Christ. Walking in this obedience enables me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, sin doesn't even want me anymore. Cool. I'm a step-by-step kind of guy, so let me put it to you this way. Step one, find out who I am in Christ. Step two, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Step three, enjoy freedom from sin. Take a moment to figure out where you are in this process. Step one, find out who I am in Christ. Is that where you are? Or be filled with the Holy Spirit. Is that where you are? Or are you enjoying freedom from sin? You know, if you're on step one, there's no, there's no shame being at step one. But don't just sit back and wait for me to spoon feed you who you are in Christ, right? Get in the Bible every single day and find out who you are in Christ. Find out who you are. Let me give you a hint. Your wrong thinking is not overcome by reading one scripture one time. All right? Find your scriptures about who you are in Christ and speak them over and over and over and over and over. Write them on your bathroom mirror. Write them in your journal. Underline them in your Bible. Read them out loud over and over, 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 and over. You know when you know you got it? You no longer doubt it. At first, when you say you're dead to sin, it might feel like a lie. I'm just lying to myself right now. But put in the work and repeat the scripture over, and over, and over, and then one day it just hits you, ha, I really am dead to sin. I really am. Maybe you're on step two. Your identity in Christ is secure and you're walking in obedience because of it, but you've yet to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you've made it through step one and you're struggling with step two, I get it because I'm a practical guy. Like, I don't like to make decisions unless I have the data in front of me. So being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's still kind of strange to me. 
He tells me to do stuff all the time without an explanation. There's no data to back it up. And it doesn't even make sense. This past Tuesday, I had a lot of work to do. Actually, I have a lot of work to do every Tuesday because Monday is my Sabbath where I take the whole day off to rest. I know it's kind of weird to have choose Monday for a Sabbath, but when you're a pastor of a church, weekends aren't very restful. They're not very restful. But since nobody else is taking off on Monday, when I open up my inbox on Tuesday, when everybody else was working yesterday, it is, it is full. So this past Tuesday, it was time to get to work. I was ready to knock it out. And then I was walking into my office and I felt the urge to pray. So I stopped to pray and I was led to pray over the land that Beth and I are believing for. You may remember a few months ago when I encouraged everybody to embrace extravagant asking. Anybody remember that? I mean, since God has promised to give us what we ask for, we might as well ask for things that are going to make a big difference, right? So that Sunday, I revealed that Beth and I are believing God for 300 acres in Skytook. It's listed for just over a million dollars, and we're believing that it's going to be ours without debt, without debt. And as I was praying about the land, the Holy Spirit told me, go to the land and rebuke the plan of the enemy. My response, can't I just do that right here? I mean, I got a lot of work to do. Silence. When the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, he, he will usually, usually only say it once, and then it's up to you. So if you're like, I don't, I'm not hearing from the Holy Spirit, he probably told you to do something he hadn't done yet. You better go do it. So I got, went and got in my car. <laughs> I drove to the land, and as I was approaching the land, I saw that the for sale sign now had another sign on it that says, under contract. But you know what? It didn't even bother me. <laughs> Honestly, my first thought was, the contract will either fall through, or the person who's buying this land will sell it to us when we're ready for it. You know why that was my response? Why I wasn't devastated by that? Because Beth and I, for months now, have been proclaiming Deuteronomy 28 over our lives, where it says that God will bless us in the land that he gives us. I said, we've said it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. So I drove onto the land. I did what the Holy Spirit told me to do. I rebuked the plan of the enemy. I don't know what he was trying to do, but y'all, I put a hard stop to it. I just shook up his plan. It's not even going to work anymore. I tell you this story to encourage all of you who struggle with the mystery of being filled with the Holy Spirit and what he asked you to do, right? There was even a time when I would ignore the Holy Spirit because I couldn't get out of my own head. I truly believed that my ability to think and reason was superior to what the Holy Spirit was asking me to do. Any, any confessions in the room? <laughs> Let me reason this out for a minute. And I've since learned that obeying the Holy Spirit is a whole lot easier. Otherwise, you spend all this time thinking about it, researching, developing your own plan just to fail and revert back to what the Holy Spirit told you to do in the first place. You know, Tim, you've been there, done that, huh? Y'all, I'm saving so much time and energy following the Holy Spirit. It's great. I love it when I follow him immediately, whether it makes sense or not. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. Sounds crazy, but I'll be a crazy man. I'll just do it. I still don't know the outcome of what he asked me to do on Tuesday, but as soon as I find out, I'll let you all know. All right, <laughs> I'll let you know. So if you've been hiding from the Holy Spirit, I hope this has encouraged you to come out of hiding. Just come out of hiding. You need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So you have the power and the boldness to accomplish God's will on the earth because you have an assignment in this and you can't accomplish it without the Holy Spirit. You got to have him. So now to step three, enjoy freedom from sin. Y'all, life is so much better without sin. Man, it's so much better. I don't know why people even fall for the lie that living in sin is fun. I don't know how we fall for that because here's the truth. Sin does not give you a good life. It destroys you with a slow, painful death. And this is why you should be diligent to follow that plan or that path to freedom from sin. Step one, find out who I am in Christ. Step two, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Step three, enjoy freedom from sin. And this last step, enjoying freedom from sin, is something that I like to call God privilege. Because we don't deserve freedom, yet God gave it to us anyways. So God privilege, and my next book is actually going to be titled God Privilege. And let me explain what I mean by comparing it to the woke counterfeit called white privilege. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but I would definitely be categorized as white. 
And although if you want to get technical, I'm a mix of many different races. I even have enough Cherokee Indian blood to be considered part of the tribe, y'all. Woo woo. Woo. Right? <laughs> That's beside the point though. As far as as far as the woke people are concerned, I'm a white male and they are not happy about it. <laughs> In my early 20s, I went to work for a church that had a predominantly black congregation. And for the first time in my life, I was the minority in the room. And growing up, I vividly remember my mom teaching me that we don't treat people different because of their skin color. I don't even know why she was telling me that, because as a kid, you're just like, well, duh. Okay. I'm glad she told me, though, because that's ingrained in me. And I've discovered that by default, kids don't care about skin color. I mean, my six-year-old... A few months ago, she saw a black man. with the same, He was like the same height as me, same body style as me, had the same beard length as me. And she said, Daddy, look! He looks just like you! <laughs> just like you! So even though skin color isn't something that I think about, I'll admit the first few days at this job, I noticed it. It was strange to be the minority. I was the only white guy in the office. The only one. It only took a few days, though, to get over the shock of this new environment before I realized what a gift it was to be engulfed in a culture that was different than my own. It was really a beautiful thing. I mean, every time we had lunch at the church, the sweet ladies in the kitchen would bring food to my office, and man, that was some good cooking, y'all. That was good stuff. And they were always worried that I was too skinny, so they would bring me more than one dessert and expect me to eat all of it. It was awesome. I actually only remember one negative race-related experience in the three years that I worked there. A woman came into the main office. She peeked into my office and she went up to the secretary and said, you mean to tell me we hired a white boy? I didn't know if I should run or if I should hide or what was going on there. Run for the hills. hills. But the secretary, who's still a great friend of mine, she did a great job handling the situation. We never talked about it again. But several years, several years after I'd moved on from this job, I reconnected with one of my coworkers there. And it was the great year of 2020, where race was being exploited for political gain. Anybody remember that? She saw a Facebook post of mine where I was supporting Donald Trump. The media did a great job convincing people that he was racist, even though he's not. So my previous coworker, she wanted to talk about it. We hopped on the phone, and we, she started the conversation with Cade. The time we spent working together made me realize that not all white people are racist. I was expecting you to slip up over the three years that you worked, that we worked together, and you never did. So I know, without a doubt, that you're not racist. And this statement shocked me because she always did a great job hiding her suspicions. I didn't know I was under trial all that time. But I'm so thankful God used me to help her overcome these challenges. You see, growing up, she had been taught to look out for white people. And for a good reason, the history between whites and blacks is troubling, you know? It really is. And my compassion runs deep for those who are hurt by the evil of racism. But if we step back and we take an honest look at the tension between blacks and and whites, we'll find that the enemy works hard to stir up the peaceful waters. Anytime we're on the verge of resolve, he just, he stirs it up and turns the tables. We're deceived into elevating one race over the other. Elevating one, on, and on the surface, it seems like a solid solution, but you think a little deeper and you'll realize, you know, we can't ever find equality if one is elevated over the other. There's no equality there. And the woke church helps the enemy advance his agenda because they proudly wear their race elevating gear to church and then they go home feeling really good about themselves for doing that. And this is a good place to pause and let you know how, if you, how to know if what you're doing is godly or not. Do your actions elevate you, or do they elevate God? If you go home patting yourself on the back, you can be sure that it had nothing to do with God. Nothing to do with Him. A good example is the people who bow to the God of racism by publicly apologizing for being white. And then they walk off with a smile on their face because they feel so good about what they just did. Let me clear this up for you. That's called worshiping an idol, the idol of racism. The woke church may be encouraging it, but Jesus' church stays far from it. This idol expresses itself in many ways, one of which being critical race theory. I want you all to notice it's a theory. You know what a theory is? It's an idea. Not a fact. (laughs) It's an idea. 
Legal scholars actually developed this idea to examine if racism was built into the legal structure. That's where CRT originated. And I think that's a worthy cause, right? I mean, if, if racism is built into our legal structures, it needs to be found and it needs to be dealt with. But CRT has been hijacked by the enemy. It's now being used as a racial weapon in our schools. And I know Amy can testify to that because she teaches in the Tulsa schools. Teachers who bow to the God of racism, they teach critical race theory, thinking that they're doing a service, but all they accomplish is turning students against each other. White kids leave class feeling ashamed about their race. And then everybody else is frustrated with their white friends because they're privileged. This reveals the next expression of the racism idol, white privilege. Here we are. We finally made it there. Yet another idea that white people have the upper hand in life simply because they're white. I want you to go ahead and prove that idea to all the white people that are struggling. I'll wait. Go ahead. Go do it. Have you ever noticed how people look for ways to put down those who are more successful? It's because they have rich parents. It's because they don't pay their employees enough. It's because they're white. The reality is there will always be somebody who has dealt a better hand in life than you. Always. They have more resources. They're more talented. They have better connections. But the only person you're responsible for is you. When you get to heaven, God's not going to ask you how somebody else used their talents. He's going to ask you how you used yours. And let me tell you something. God's not impressed by those who have the most. He's impressed by those who multiply what they have. Man, that's good. Read the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 to get a good grasp on that. But white privilege, it's not part of the solution. It's a distraction. So what is the solution? Well, in the book of Romans, you'll find the apostle Paul. He's actually working hard throughout the whole book to disarm the racial tensions between the Jews and the Gentiles. Interestingly, he addresses the issue of the Jews being privileged and the Gentiles not. But instead of trying to make the Jews feel bad about their privileged status, you know what he does? He invites the Gentiles to be part of it. Man, it's good. Take a look. In Romans 5, 2, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. So this is what I like to call God privilege, and it's available to all who believe in Christ, no matter what race they are. The woke church doesn't want anybody to be privileged, but Jesus' church seeks to walk in God privilege. We, We seek to walk in it so that we can show other people how to do the same. So this is the answer to racism. Instead of teaching others about critical race theory and white privilege, we got to focus on leading people to Jesus and letting them know, hey, God privilege is available to you. It's available to, available to all who believe. God privilege is available to me. It's available to you. So are you going to keep griping about how life isn't fair? Are you just going to keep griping about it? Or are you going to step into the promises of God and show other people how to do the same? So that's my next book, God Privilege. And that's what I'm going to show people how to do, walk in the promises of God. Because it's for everybody. It's for everybody. The promises of God are for everybody. So if you're ready to enjoy freedom from sin and walk in God privilege, I want you to stand to your feet. If you're ready to walk in God privilege, stand to your feet. And I want you to raise both hands. And this is just a sign of surrender right now, letting God know that you're elevating him above everything else. God, we are elevating you above everything else. We seek to walk in your promises because your promises are good. We seek to walk in obedience because obedience is good. We thank you that you freed us from sin, that you took our sin away. Lord, teach us who we are in you. Light a fire on the inside of every person in this room to get in the scriptures and to meditate and to speak these scriptures out loud about who they are in Christ, that I am dead to sin and alive to God that I am the righteousness of God in Christ, that I've been given the gift of righteousness and I receive it and I walk in it. Ooh, give us a great hunger, God, for your word. That when we wake up in the mornings, the first thing on our minds is the word. We want your word. We hunger for your word. We thirst for your word. And when we get into your word, we understand your word because we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us teaching us and showing us 
God, we thank you for your word. We honor your word this morning. God, you protected it through the ages so that we could have it in our hands, so that we could read it. And then you called these people to put it into app form so we could have it in our pockets, on our phones, wherever we go. God, you orchestrated all of this for us. Your word is so precious to us. Praise you, God. Lord, I can sense your heart that in these end times, you need your people to walk in your promises because you need them to be equipped to do everything that you've asked them to do. That when you ask them to start this business, they do it. When you ask them to run for this office, they can do it because they have the resources in their hand to do it. The church needs to be resourced. We should be, we should have all the resources we need to accomplish what God has for us to do. And that's why we have to seek to walk in the promises of God. So God, we submit to you this morning. We cast aside all the wrong thinking, all these lies about poverty, that poverty is good, and blah, 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 blah. We cast all that aside right now. We cast aside jealousy because we know that jealousy keeps us from receiving those things. So we cast that aside. God, this isn't about what other people are doing. This is about what you need me to do. This is about obedience. That when you say, go to that land and rebuke the, the devil, <laughs> that we do it. When you say, take that road instead of that road, we do it. And when you say, run for state representative, we do it. When you say, run for senator, we do it. Whatever it is, when you say, start this business, we do it. When you say, get into the education system, we do it. God, you're calling your church out into the world. Well, you did that a long time ago. I don't know how we got sidetracked. Bring us out of these four walls and place us into the place that we need to be. Whether it's in business or entertainment, God, you've called us to be in places of authority over these worldly systems. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. All the world. Make disciples of the nations. God, the church should be the one in these places of authority, in these places of government, making disciples of the nations. And we've been lazy and we repent of that right now. We repent of our laziness and our apathy and not doing what you've asked us to do. We push that aside, God, and we ask you to make up the time, all that time where we've missed it. We ask you to make up that time and perform a great miracle and get us into those places that we need to be. Hallelujah. Man, y'all, what we see unfold over the next few months, the next few years is just going to be incredible. But it can only be incredible if we cooperate. God can't do this by himself. He's chosen to work through people. And so we have to start saying yes. Yes, Lord, I will do it. Yes, Lord, I will do it. Let's just practice that. Say, yes, Lord, I will do it. I will do it. Yes, yes, yes. Anything you ask me to do, I'll do it. You kind of got to practice that sometimes because I think we're in the habit of saying, no, God, I won't do that. (laughs) That's like our first response is no, but no, we got to change that. Yes, yes, right now, I'll do it. I'll I'll do it. I'll do it. Hmm. Is there somebody in the room that needs to share what God asked them to do? You're saying, yes, God, I will do it. Come on up. There may be more than one. So several different people and one person uh, a long time ago, Beth had approached me saying, you need to run for an office. And, and I, and I was like, Oh, you're crazy. <laughs> That's not the kind of, I'm not that kind of person. I don't, I don't do that kind of stuff. And, and yeah, yeah. And then her mother-in-law approached me. Some other people did. And every time I kept saying, okay, God, you're going to have to put more people across my path before I decide to run for an office. Um, and I think it, everyone's seen that God's been preparing me. Um, it's been a journey the last two years in education, um, just some changes that have been made and things that, things that I have had to step forward and just be brave and do. And, and, but God's protected me through all that. Um, and that was all preparation. And so I finally, uh, just listened and, and said, here I am, send me. 
Um, that's, that's all I really want to do. And so um, I, I contacted people I knew who were already in government offices and could give me advice. And last night I made the decision to run for state representative, uh, District 74, and in Oklahoma. <laughs> so yes, as as a as a Republican, and so. Um, so it, it took a lot of prayer and 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 decision making. But I, then I realized last night after talking to a seasoned uh, representative that, uh, that there's a lot of hard work ahead, and that I have to get started on that work now. It's not something I can wait until next spring when I file. I already need to be um, applying prayer and scripture to this every day and um, starting that journey now. So um, my prayer is not necessarily victory uh, as far as the most votes. My prayer is that God's presence will be obvious in my, in my journey through this, that they will see God in my campaign and that that will be what is attractive to people, that, they, that they're, they're going to see someone who is, who is going to represent them with God as their foundation. Amen. That's so good. But I can't tell you how exciting that is. Like, woo! Y'all can go ahead and take a seat. Is there anybody else who wants to come up and share? God's asked you to do something and you're going to do it. And we're going to hold you accountable. <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> well, today I was told to share. Um, I seem to be up here a lot as of recently. Hmm. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, these past few months, I have been reading through my Bible. Uh, this past month specifically, I've been going through the book of Genesis. I've been doing it uh, one chapter at a time and also reading the Psalms as well. Um, right now, I am in the story of Joseph. For those who don't know, uh, whether you be online or in the room, the, the story of Joseph goes something like this. Uh, Joseph was one of 12 brothers, and he received a dream from God that he was going to rule over his brothers, and his brothers were going to bow before him. When he told his brothers, they didn't like that. I wonder why. Especially seeing as he wasn't the firstborn, and you know, the firstborn, especially at the time that Joseph was alive, they often got, you know, the rights of the house, uh, the favor of the father, the birthright. And so none, most of his other brothers did not like that. So what they did was they threw him into a pit. They were going to kill him, but one of the brothers uh, who was intending to try and save him later stopped them from killing him. And then he was sold as a slave for uh, like 20 silver pieces. And he ended up as a servant in uh, an Egyptian's house, in a nobleman's house. After being there and being a good steward to this person he uh, was wrongly accused falsely accused of uh, by the nobleman's wife of sexually assaulting her essentially so he was thrown in prison for it after while he was in prison God's favor showed on him, and he ended up stewarding the prison for the warden, as a prisoner, no less. Um, and he spent uh, about, I think it was seven years, I don't quite remember off the top of my head, in that prison, and... after being in that prison for so long he was brought before Pharaoh the king of Egypt to interpret a dream that he had and 
when he interpreted that dream, uh, he said, well, the Pharaoh received two dreams and they were both essentially the same thing of there's going to be seven years of prosperity and then there's going to be seven years of famine, a seven year drought and just everything gone. So Joseph said to Pharaoh, hey, I would advise you to take one fifth of all of the crops that are produced for the next seven years so that you can be ready for the seven years after that of famine. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, all right, how about you step up as my second and we will do your plan and you can watch over it. He went from being sold as a slave by his, uh, by his brothers to being the second in command of the greatest empire of the day. And during the famine, his dream that he had had and shared with his brothers ended up coming to pass. His brothers, not knowing Joseph was even alive, where he was, they came to him and bowed before him uh, to purchase grain like they had stored uh, for those last seven years. They didn't recognize him and Joseph decided to have a little fun with him. Long story short, mess with him a little bit, get him back. But God provided for Joseph's family even though his family had abandoned Joseph. God provided for the people he promised to multiply even when they weren't all there, even when they weren't doing everything correctly. And nonetheless, they did it through the one person that the people in the family despised. So... There are multiple lessons you can get out of that. God will not forsake you even when everyone, including your closest family, has forsaken you. God will provide for you even when you've done some terrible, horrible, no good, really bad things. He'll make sure that all of your needs are met no matter what you've done. When you are at the bottom, when you've hit rock bottom, God sees that and he will take you if you'll go along with him straight to the top of wherever you need to be. Whatever mountain peak you end up uh, lording over, he will put you there. He'll give you the ability to stand there righteously honestly, truly, to stand there with authority, the authority that God gave all of us. No matter where you are, whether it be the peak of a church, the peak of uh, the Senate, the state representative, Congress, whether it be the peak of the President of the United States, or, in Joseph's case, second in command of Egypt. And as Talon would more than likely say if he were up here too, Egypt represents sin. So the righteous man was the ruler over all of the, over all of the things that would later be referred to as the unrighteous land. So just because God calls you to something doesn't mean it's going to be necessarily in the church as we have as an example in Amy. He may call you to some weird places. There's probably a lot more in that, but I feel like that's all I need to say today. While Talon's coming up, uh, while he was talking, I heard the the Lord say, tell my people that the windows of heaven are open. And then I had this visual of 
We're all walking by it. We're looking over. Oh, that's pretty. And then we just walk off. Like the windows of heaven are open. They're pouring out this blessing. Like who's going to go contain it? You can't contain it because there's so much, but you need to be a part of it. Quit walking by and live in the promises. Yep. So I just felt the kind of tugging of the Holy Spirit to get up here and share with you guys kind of what I've been working on um, besides my full-time job. And in Exodus, there's a scripture. It says, six days shalt thou do all thy labor and complete all thy work. And most of us only work five days at a full-time job, right? Monday through Friday. So the, the Holy Spirit began to ask me, what's your six-day project going to be? And so I started thinking about that. And this is like about 10 years ago now that I was having this conversation with God. And I started working on building a kind of a business training platform online. And I've been working on it for 10 years now. And um, I don't have it done yet, but there's a few last steps that I'm working on to get it launched to where I can start enrolling students. But throughout that time, there was different times when I was motivated to work on it really hard. And there was times when I almost like just quit and put it to the back burner and forgot about it and went months without doing anything. And I would ask myself, am I, why am I doing this? I already have a job <laughs> and it's paying my bills. So is it selfish? Is it, what am I going after? Is this, you know, what's in my heart? I had to do some soul searching. And I felt kind of like maybe it was like a selfish ambition, and like we were talking about this morning. And so I was struggling to, to know why I even wanted this thing, you know. And um, the more I searched and the more I realized, and I actually was reading in the New Testament, it says, aspire to work with your own hands. And so I thought, okay, I need to definitely do something with my own hands. Why would God put this desire in my heart? And throughout that soul searching, I realized that he wants me to teach the Bible at the same time I teach business, aligning the two to show how you can grow spiritually and God will grow you and prosper you because he said he has hopes and a plan to give us a future, to prosper us, to give us hope. And so if you believe that, Jeremiah uh, 29, 11, you know, then um, he he will prosper you. There's a lot of judgment for business people who are successful. (laughs) People look and they go, you know, oh, we're supposed to be poor. We're supposed to whatever, you know, humble ourselves. Humble yourselves doesn't mean you be poor. It means poor in spirit. It, and in fact, it's selfish to not be in a place to where we can help others when they need so that they can live. And so that's a revelation that I had to get myself to because I was under that poverty mentality. I had to break that off my life and I had to break off passivity and ask God to give me the finisher's anointing because I was tired of starting something and stopping, you know, and I wanted to finish. <laughs> I'm like, I got to finish. And now I'm an idiot if I don't finish it after spending 10 years on it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And so that's the way I see it now. And uh, I'm on the last steps. I have to make some videos and do the editing, finish SEO in the blog post, make a Facebook ad. Um, and then it'll be launched and going. And then, of course, that's when the motivation will really come in, I think, even more so for me to keep building it. Uh, but ultimately, I, I hope to lead people to the Lord through it. And I hope to encourage you guys and inspire you. And I, want, and I told you, I want you to hold me accountable <laughs> to finishing. <laughs> but also, if you guys have a dream that you're working toward, come and talk to me because I, I would like to hold you accountable as well. So I love you guys. That's all I had to say. <laughs> Who loves some good accountability? <laughs> Man. Anthony, I got to prophesy over your life. This has been stirring in my spirit for weeks now. It's, it's not complete yet. Like I'm only giving you a part of the prophecy, but like you need to get it today. And the prophecy is what the Holy Spirit's been telling me is What Anthony is doing now, he's going to look back and it's going to look like nothing compared to where I move him to in the future. Like it seems really big and significant, but it's going to seem really small and more like a warm up whenever you get moved into where you're supposed to be. And that's the half prophecy. And I feel like there's more coming. It just hasn't been revealed to me yet. And I hope that resonates with where you're at and what you're walking through. 
Beth. While she's doing that, um, I feel like there are people out there that are like, all of you are hearing God, and how do I hear prophecy, and how do I hear where, you know, all of those things. And I had a conversation with a friend that I've had the chance to mentor past some really nasty religious things, um, and she asked me, okay, I, I, I see you stepping out, and I see you praying for me in, at opportune times, and how do you hear God like that? And I'd never thought about it, honestly, because I grew up in an amazing home where it was just part of life. And so I stepped back and said, God, how do I, how do I know that it's you? Um, and God said, because of the peace. My brain goes constantly all the time. I'm a, you know, go, go, go. Um, and, but when, I, when it's him, everything else is blocked out. I don't hear anything else. I don't feel anything else. Um, it's just a, this is me, go do it. Um, now, I will say when I first started doing this, I would argue. <laughs> um, and so that, that would stir things back up again. But in that moment, I started to recognize when everything else is blocked out, when I don't feel anything but God, when I don't hear anything but, God, but that voice, you know that that's Him in that moment. So if you're struggling with that, take those, those seconds where He says, move, and you start to argue, back up. Um, back up, it's God, okay? And start recognizing that because He talks to all of us. And that's another thing she needed to hear is that He doesn't just talk to the pastor. He doesn't just talk to the elders. He talks to all of us. We just have to take those moments where it's just Him and recognize it for what it is, so. Did you forget something? No, I just felt the need to add to what you have just said. God does speak to all of us. That is correct. He speaks to you in the way that you understand. He doesn't speak to Kay quite the same way he speaks to me. He doesn't speak to my dad quite the same way he speaks to Anthony. He doesn't speak to Tal in the same way he speaks to Dylan. It's all different. It's tailored to us. God knows how to speak to you because he made you with his own hands. He knows you cell for cell, atom for atom, hair for hair. He coded you the way you are, essentially. And he knows how to speak to you. All of you, all of us. So just because Kate gets an audible voice every once in a while. He may not speak to you that way. Me, I've gotten that audible voice one time, maybe twice. But a lot of other times it's, it's in my spirit, in my breath that he speaks to me. And in my friend Josh, who's out in the Navy, he spoke to him through a meme. Not even joking. And he showed it to me. It was awesome and hilarious. God will speak to you how you need to hear it. And as she, as she said just before, you will know it's him. Every time. Good. When I say God talks to me, go ahead and come on up, Mom. I don't hear an audible voice. It's actually comes, I'm a thinker. So what you just said, Mason, resonates because that's my gifting. I write, even my messages, I write them out because it comes more through my mind. So when God speaks to me, he speaks to me in a thought that I know is not mine. He's, the devil can try to imitate that, but his comes as an intrusive thought, whereas God's comes as a peaceful thought. And you're just like, I didn't think that, but I feel his presence and I know it's him. And that's how he talks to me most of the time. Okay, 
I was not, I was trying to not obey. Sorry, forgive me, Lord. <laughs> forgive me, congregation. <laughs> so I was one of the ones with Amy, and she came up to me, and I told her, she said, but I'm not qualified to run for an office. I said, oh, wait a minute. If God called you, you're qualified. Amen. And he will qualify you with what needs to be qualified. So if you're here and you've been saying, God's been speaking to you, he's called you out, he's called you to something, and you've been saying, but I'm not qualified, stand up. We're going to qualify you this morning. Come on. I know you're in here. God's called you. You've been denying it. You've been saying, I can't do it. I don't have those skills. I'm too shy. I don't want. Two. Oh, I uh, got one. I don't want to. My mom said I couldn't. My dad said I couldn't. My teacher said I couldn't. I'm not smart enough. All right. There you go. Oh, oh, got some more. If anything's been stopping you, any excuse, but you know that you know, Tal in 10 years, she's been working on this, but he's not giving up. This could go back 10 years, 20 years. It could go back a long time. It's not over. You're still here. All right. These brave souls, are you ready to let go of that doubt? Are you ready to say, I'm qualified? Say it right now. I'm qualified. I'm qualified. Because Jesus qualified me. Amen. Amen. Father, I just thank you and I praise you today for these that stood up. They were brave enough to say, I've had doubt. I didn't trust God. I didn't think I was qualified. But today they said, I am qualified and I'm going to stand and I'm going to stand on the thing that you told me to do, God, and I'm going to obey. And so I break right now any doubt that has been spoken over them by a parent, by a teacher, by a pastor, by anybody in their life. I break that in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Father God, that that is broken. They will walk out of here and they will say, okay, God, now what do we do and how do we do it? And you're going to show them. You are faithful to your word. You are faithful to your callings to give us the direction that we need to accomplish what you've called us to do. And so I speak that over them right now in Jesus' name. And I thank you for the testimonies that are going to come out of that. And I thank you that it's never too late. We're still standing. We're still here. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you will bring this to pass in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, is there anybody in the room who needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit? My, when we were talking about that earlier, you're the one that's been running from it, hiding from it. Don't know if I can handle that. But today you're like, I, I want it now. If that's you, raise your hand. Yeah, man? All right. Anybody else? Raise your hand. All right, come on up here. Yes, you got to come up here to be filled. Come on. If you're led to come lay hands on this guy, come lay hands on him. We're going to see him filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says to lay hands on you, and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I'm, I'm waiting. Look at all these people coming up here. You got a lot of hands on you. So in the name of Jesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit, man. Be filled. Be filled from the. T be filled all the way. All the way. Be filled. Be filled with, oh, there's his love. He feels love. He's got to wash away some things first. He's washing it away right now. Yeah, let it, let it go. Just let it go. Hallelujah. Ooh, praise you, God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Sometimes he has to empty us to be filled. <laughs> empty it all, Brandon. Don't hold on to anything. Amen. 
and now let it be filled. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with power. Be filled with boldness. Be filled with truth. You're not going to be confused anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometime in the next few days, man, you're going to receive your prayer language. I don't, I don't know why it's not today, but he has one for you. He has one for all of us. Could be tomorrow. Could be a few days from now. One day something's going to come over you. You'll be like, what, 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 what is this? What do I feel? What is this? And you need to open your mouth and you need to speak. And you're not going to understand what you say. It's going to be your heavenly prayer language. And you're going to be able to pray out those mysteries, those things you don't know what to pray for. You're going to be able to pray for your daughter in the spirit, all those perfect prayers. You're going to be, be able to pray over the, all those family situations that you deal with. Tell me what happens. Yep. But you're filled now. I feel happy. Yeah, man. We love you, man. Good. Um, I've been struggling with how to tell you this for weeks weeks and Tim said something to me I don't know if he remembers a couple weeks ago and it started stirring up in me and Gina I'm the one and I don't wanna I don't wanna I don't so I'm gonna um, your book, part of the reason it is so important and part of why God's laid this on your, it, it's, it's not so much about woke as it is deliverance. The, the, the core and the root of it is deliverance. Um, because when they realize who they are in Christ and the righteousness, that's when the freedom will really come from the things that they want to be delivered from but they what what I saw was a cage in the jungle and there was bananas that were in the cage and those things could represent all kinds of things that people want to be delivered from drugs alcohol pornography uh, judgment lying uh, low self-esteem all those things that are in that cage. Well, the problem is, is they're like a monkey on the outside of that cage and they're reaching into that cage. They're trying to grab a hold and they have a hold of that banana because they want it so bad. They've got this banana and they won't, and because they don't know, they don't have that revelation of righteousness. What happens is, is they don't want, they, they can't let go of that banana. So the enemy's coming up behind them and clubbing them on the head all the time. But they don't want to let go of that banana. That's where this is going. People start letting go of the banana. And then the freedom comes. Now that's for you. Anybody in here that has been struggling with that low self-esteem... Addiction pornography bad bad sexual thoughts all of those things there's freedom you just gotta let go of that banana the way you know to get rid of the banana you need to listen what God's speaking through your pastor listen and dig in and do some things you gotta find out who you are in Christ when you find out who you are in Christ, it all starts to unfold. You realize who you are and what kind of favor you really do have. Then you don't want that banana anymore. But you can't let go of it till you get that I know. Now the I don't want a part, I know I'm supposed to go in to either the school board or the city council. And I don't want to. 
I don't want, I don't want to wear a tie. I don't want to wear a shirt. But he says, that's okay. So they're getting ready to get shook up one way or another. Um, I'm going to go in and be me. So, yes. That's awesome. Woohoo. I know we're a little longer than we normally go, but we're not in a hurry, right? Awesome. So I want to do one more thing. If there's anybody who needs healing today, healing in your body, healing in your mind, healing in relationships, I want you to just go ahead and come on up to the front so we can lay hands on you and see that taken care of today, right now. Come on up. If you need healing in your body, come on up. Anybody else need healing? If there's anybody who believes they are to operate in the healing anointing this morning, come on up and lay hands on these two. Join me. Spiritual gifts aren't just given to the pastor. Yep. I'm up here for healing manifestation. I understand that I mean, all this new class that we've been doing and everything. And I fully understand that Jesus has already done everything he needs to do. And that all the power that's needed and all the healing that's needed and all that I, that's there, it's in me. And I understand that, but I haven't quite gotten the release it part. And so that's my desire. Amen. We agree with you for that. Coming up here to pray. Awesome. Rebecca, you've already been healed. I laid hands on you last week. And the healing, anointing, virtue, whatever you want to call it, like I just... I could sense it going into your body and just taking care of your heart, that issue that you were having, that you were having, because you're not having it anymore. What you're dealing with now is fear. Not sickness, but fear. But you're no longer a slave to fear. So Lord, I... I ask you to melt this fear away with your perfect love right now. Fear, we command you to go. Leave. A sound mind. In Jesus' name. Relax. Trust him. I know you've got some doctor's appointments coming up. But don't walk into those fearful. Walk into those confident that you're going to get a good report. Relax. God's not done. He has purpose for you. He has things for you to do still. Don't let the enemy sidetrack you. Amen. Amen. I'm agreeing with you, Gala. You keep repeating those scriptures over and over and over and over and over till it settles in, right? You know you got it when? When you don't doubt it anymore. If you're still doubting it, then you better keep saying it. Keep saying the scriptures over and over. Did you need to say something, Gracie? Oh, this is for me? Thank you. She drew me a picture. Thank you, Gracie. All right. Well, Lord, we thank you for everything. You're such a faithful God. You're such a good God. 
and we worship you today. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. And we thank you. Well, y'all, next I want to show you a video. Uh, We've been talking about our fundraiser for the PRC. So this is a story of somebody who's went through their program. So I just want you to see firsthand what goes on there. So take a look at the screen. I grew up without a mom, and my dad was not the best example due to his lifestyle. Um, When I became pregnant, I was so scared. I did not know what to do. I just wanted to be the best mom. My mom died of cancer when I was one, and that left my dad to raise me. And he, um, he raised me to the best of his ability. There was a lot of drugs and alcohol and criminal activity. I didn't really have a lot of guidance, so I, of course, kind of followed in my family's footsteps and um, chose the path of drugs and alcohol and criminal activity. And I had been abused, all sorts of abuse you can think of. You know, there was, there was rape. There was, um, you know, I was held hostage once um, with guns to my head all sorts of stuff. I mean, I could really get into it. Um, I woke up one day and I found my best friend murdered. Like, that's how dark and deep that whole life was for me. You know, I, I was raised without God. I, um, my dad told me that if there was a God, then he was God. So I was very confused growing up. And, you know, I kind of had to find that on my own. And I found it in prison. Uh, when I was incarcerated, I finally surrendered. And... I was able to, you know, find God and just kind of stop fighting the current, and I let Him lead my life. You know, now looking back, I'm like, who was that person? I don't even know who that was. Um, I decided to stay consistent. I stayed consistent with my walk with God, um, and I stayed consistent with my job. You know, yesterday I celebrated four years sober, so I'm super excited. Um... I have an amazing job. I never thought an ex-convict would have a job like I have now. And, uh, you know, me and my husband are actually buying a house. I'm actually married. I just had a baby. Yes, PRC has been amazing. It helped teach me all sorts of stuff to actually how to be a mom. Um, I didn't know anything about being a mom. I didn't know anything about having a baby. I don't, I don't even have any brothers and sisters. So I didn't know anything about pregnancy or I was like, man, there must be some sort of resources out there. So I Google it, and I see Pregnancy Resource Center of Owasso. And I'm like, hmm, let me call this place. And I call, and I talk to one of the directors, and uh, she was like, come in, I'll tell you all about it. So I came, and she kind of showed me around, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. It's a faith-based program. I loved the fact that you could earn points and use these points to buy diapers or buy clothes. Um, to even buy a car seat, um, play pin. I mean, you use all these points that you work so hard for. I haven't even had to um, buy any diapers yet, ever. And that's just amazing. I've been collecting them. Believe me, my apartment was filled with them, but hey, it helped me a lot. I don't know if there's ever the perfect time. I think that it's God's time. And if it's meant to be, God will provide everything for that baby. Just like he literally provided almost everything for my baby, you know. Um, a lot of people think that they're not ready due to like financial stuff, um, but I mean, there's resources out there that will pay for everything if you have a baby. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that's so awesome. So, you know, this abortion issue that we talk about, it seems paralyzing, right? It seems like too big to be overcome, but it's not. We will defeat this evil. We're going to defeat it. And it really starts with our prayer time. When we pray, we need to bind the plan of the enemy and take authority over our nation. That's our role in this. Command truth to go forth out of the mouth of every child of God and defeat all the lies of the enemy. They're trying to convince people that abortion is a woman's right and all that other nonsense that they say. But then we need to get involved right here in our community. And that's why we've been highlighting the PRC the past few weeks. And this is the last Sunday that I'm going to talk about this fundraiser for our local pregnancy resource center. I just encourage every one of you to get in on this. Sow a seed. When we're sowing seed into the will of God and what it's going to reap is a harvest of life in our community. And that's why we're doing it. So if you're giving by cash or check, just raise your hand right now. One of our ushers will bring you an offering envelope. 
Be sure to write PRC on that envelope to designate your gift to the Pregnancy Resource Center. And if you're giving online, go ahead and select the Pregnancy Resource Center fund, and you can give that special donation alongside your normal tithes and offerings. It's so great to have that right here in our community. What a blessing. It's, it's awesome. All right, y'all. If you enjoyed the message today, you'll definitely enjoy the book. So you can actually get, if you're here in the room today, I want to give you guys one. So I set them out there on the big table. Just grab one on your way out. If you'd like me to sign it, I'll do that for you. Just come find me if you can, and I'll sign it for you. For those watching online, if you want to get the book, just go to JesusAin'tWoke.com. And you can also get a t-shirt there. You see some of them in the room. If you're like, where do you get that t-shirt? You get it at JesusAin'tWoke.com. I don't have them on hand. They're actually printed on demand. So you have to go online to order those.